Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Ali. Okay. I'm one of the general internists at Pascac Valley Medical Group, and my office is over down on Old Hook Road. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about advanced care planning, what that is exactly, what, why is it important, why is it something that we're talking about right now with everything that's going on, and kind of give you some tools about how to approach it and uh, what do you do once you have it kind of thing. We'll just go ahead and get started. This is relatively informal. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no you know, lawyer or anything like that, but, but at least I'm give you the medical perspective from where we're coming from and why this is important to us and to you. So in light of the current events, obviously we all know that we have a COVID pandemic going around and these cases have been soaring throughout the country. And this is kind of what's brought advanced care planning back into the spotlight. As many people know, with COVID, uh, patients are coming into the hospital often alone because family members or friends or people like that are just really not able to come in with them. And in some cases, some of these patients are very short of breath, coming in unable to communicate what their wants and wishes are. And like I said, they're unable to bring people with them to speak on their behalf. The majority of people feel like it's important to put your wishes in writing should something like this occur, but the reality is maybe only a fraction of that have actually done that for themselves. So what really is advanced care planning? So it's kind of a, we use the top, the words advanced care planning to talk about the whole process, but then there's a lot of other kind of things about it, like the specific documents and things like that, that we're going to go over. Advanced care planning really is just the process that supports you at any stage of your, or age in your health to understand your personal values, your goals, and your preferences for your medical care moving forward. It should be proactive communication between yourself, family members, your doctors. And really the goal of it is so that you receive care in line with your, what your values and what your goals are for yourself moving forward. And so that's the whole idea behind this, is that what's done is really what you, what you would want, even if you can't express that yourself. So what is an advanced directive? I'm sure we've heard a lot about this or heard these terms before. So the actual advanced directive is the documents. These are the legal tools that, that kind of help us through this process, okay? These are documents that you would complete while you still have the decisional capacity um, to make choices about your treatment and should you lose that capacity, this is when this type of thing comes into play. This can be specifically about what treatments you want or don't want and it can also involve appointing a surrogate, somebody to make the decisions on your behalf. These are really only acted upon if you're unable to make the decision yourself. And that's an important thing. It's really, it's not somebody talking over you. It's really somebody talking for you. But if you have the ability to make these decisions on your own, then this really doesn't come into play. So this really can be done at any time, but it can also be revoked either verbally or in writing, assuming that you have that decisional capacity to do so. Okay, so that's something else to kind of keep in mind. So who should have an advanced directive? In an ideal world, everybody. And no matter how old you are or what stage in your life, it's good to have something like this or at least have thought about something like this. You may remember that in the past we see some of these very famous cases in the news and media. And a lot of times those kind of end up being young patients who really have never done anything like this, have never really expressed anything. And there's a lot of turmoil between families over what to do. I mean, that's not probably as common as someone who's older. So certainly advanced directors are a good idea for everybody, but particularly if you're 65 or older, or if you already know you have a serious life-threatening illness, such as cancer, or if you're at end-stage heart or liver disease, something like that. So the main documents that are used as advanced directives are the durable power of attorney for health care and also the living will. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more about what they are and how they differ. So the durable power of attorney, and this is also known as the healthcare proxy or your healthcare power of attorney. This is the person that you would appoint to do your decision making for you. And this is a signed legal document for this person to make your medical decisions. Now this is different than your financial power of attorney, something separate. This is really specifically for, for medical decision making. So this proxy, this person that you appoint can speak to all caregivers on your behalf 
make decisions based on your any kind of directions that you've given prior for you. If for some reason in a special situation your wishes aren't known and again you're not able to trust them, then your proxy would be the one to decide based on what he or she believes you would have wanted. And it should really be based on conversation that you've had with them before. So at least they kind of know what your values are and what you would have wanted for yourself. But there is no legal requirement for you to really have to choose a surrogate. But selecting someone really can be helpful to clarify who you want to decide for you. So when you select someone, you really want to make sure it's somebody that you know and you trust somebody that you think can separate their own wishes from yours and really kind of be your advocate and speak for you. Someone that you know would carry out those wishes if necessary. Somebody that could ideally be reached if necessary, you know, easily reached. And somebody could probably even handle other family members who may have different wishes from you or kind of have their own agendas about or thoughts on what should occur. You know, and that's kind of a touchy subject. Those are kind of what you want to think about when you're trying to choose somebody. Ideally, you should have a backup person as well in case that initial person becomes unwilling or unable to really act on your behalf. The person really should not be your doctor or your nurse. <laughs> Um, it really should be somebody that's not involved in your in the healthcare decision making. They're not somebody that's treating you. Most of these states require that this should be in writing. Uh, the proxy should be in writing. If you don't designate somebody, if it's something that you just don't get around to or whatever, typically the order in which they're going to go to is first the spouse, if there is one, and the adult child, a parent, adult sibling, adult grand grandchild, and close friend in that order. So that's usually going to be the default kind of list that they'll go down. Now, living will. So this is different um, in that this is more of a document summarizing your preferences for medical care as opposed to the proxy as a person, right? So this typically addresses life support, resuscitative measures. It can also encompass hospitalization, pain control, specific treatments like chemotherapy, dialysis, and tube feedings, that those types of things, like organ donation or, or something like that would be was something that you would want. Now, the living will takes effect if you're terminally ill without a chance for recovery and outlines your desires to withhold heroic measures or things that you would, you would want done. Okay, so this is more specifically about um, treatment and, and things like that. Now, things you want to consider, again, you know, a living will can also be revoked at any time, assuming you have the decisional capacity. The thing with living wills is that they're not always uh, recognized across state lines, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. And a living will is a little bit more limited than a health care proxy. So, so a lot of people have both. That's, that's something to think about. Now, in terms of this do not resuscitate. Um, so. I'm sure you've heard this before, the DNR order. So resuscitation is the attempt by the medical staff to restart your heart and your breathing, such as via CPR. Sometimes other medical devices are used, like ventilators and things like that. Um, you know, some patients don't, don't want to go through all that, and, and they, they want a DNR order, which essentially means if you should stop breathing or your heart should stop, you know, nothing, nothing really will be, will be done um, to, to keep keep you alive. If you're in the hospital and this is something that you, you wish, it's something that you'd have to have them ask them to <clears throat> add to your medical record. Under these cases, usually the, the DNR order only stands for that particular hospitalization, meaning that if you should go into the hospital, sign a DNR and be discharged and God forbid have to come back for something else or another time, um, usually you have to renew it again at that so usually with each subsequent admission, uh, a new DNR order has to be signed. Another tool that we have is something called the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. So this is something that you would fill out if you already have a serious illness or you're already weak and you know you're most likely going to need some sort of medical care moving forward. Um, it spells out exactly what care should be given or not given based on your choices or wishes. So in, in that way, it's, it's similar to, to a living will. Um, usually this is signed by your doctor and yourself with copies kept at places where you may go for, for medical treatment or care um, and kind of kept on file. These are usually state specific. New Jersey has one, New York has one, where, but there's what's called like a medical order um, for life sustaining treatment. And a lot of these things can actually be found online. I'm going to go into that a little bit more about the, the tools that are available to us. 
So now that we kind of know what's out there, now this is where the hard part comes, you know, where we have to be brave enough to start a conversation that matters, you know, with our family, with our friends. How do we do this? Okay, now we know what these things are, but how, how do we go about figuring this out? Um, some people prefer, prefer to go straight to a lawyer, okay, and, and that's, that's available, obviously, um, to people. But then there's a lot of online tools um, out there to kind of help walk us through the process, and a lot of these are, are legal and valid and uh, pretty easy to do, okay? And even if it's not something that you may, may wish to, to do right now, it's something that can kind of at least get the, get the wheels turning and we can think about. So the American Association for Retired Persons, they have some information on their website. Um, there's a nonprofit organization called Aging with Dignity, and they have what they call Five Wishes, which I'm going to go into a little bit more just because I think that one's kind of, kind of interesting and all-encompassing. Caring Info also has, has a way to, to do this, and then, of course, the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, uh, and that's state-specific. So there is one for New Jersey uh, and, and so forth, and they have a website also. So the five wishes, I'm, I'm going into this one a little bit just because it's kind of unique in the sense that it kind of combines the living will and also um, some other healthcare agent forms to address a lot of different areas, medical, personal, emotional, spiritual aspects of life. It's pretty interesting in that way. Um, it also meets the legal requirements as an adv advanced directive in 42 states and the District of Columbia. So this, this is something that would kind of cross borders if, God forbid, something should happen um, outside of the state that you reside in currently. So the five wishes, so it's made up of these five, five areas that we kind of focus on. So wish one is about the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't. So that's essentially your healthcare proxy or surrogate, the person that you're appointing um, to speak on your behalf, okay? So wish two, this is the, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want. And so that part's kind of the living will part of it. Am I okay with, with dialysis or do I not want to be intubated or um, th things, like, things like that, okay? Wish number three is how comfortable I want to be. So this has to do with things like pain management, um, hospice care, if that's something um, that, that, that may, may need to be, be considered. Personal matters um, is wish four, how I want people to treat me. Those, those are personal matters. Like, do I prefer to be, be at home in the comfort of my own home? Or am, am, I, am I okay with people praying over me or you know, things, things like that, okay? And then, and then wish five has to do with kind of how do we want to be remembered or um, is like possibly funeral, funeral arrangements, you know, what I want my loved ones to know, okay? Um, things like that. So, so it kind of encompasses a little bit of everything there um, uh, for you. And again, this is available online. Okay, so now that you've done all this, now, now what am I supposed to do with this thing, right? Okay, so I mean, first and foremost, if you've designated someone to be a surrogate, you really should give them a copy of the document so that, you know, they, they have that on hand. <clears throat> um, you can also give copies to your doctor, to your lawyer, your significant other, or, or anybody else um, that you think might, might need it if, God forbid, something, something should happen, or at least tell people where they can find it. Um, some people like to keep a little note in their purse or their wallet, so if anything were to happen to them, because um, that's usually the first place that people are going to look if someone's alone and, and something occurs, you know, they're going to look in their wallet or their bag um, and for information, and, and that, that could be a helpful place uh, to keep a little note that you have something there, too. So, yeah, these are all kind of difficult conversations, but, you know, it's really easier to discuss some of these things, uh, these end-of-life issues, when you are well and you can make your desires known to people. That makes it a lot easier on your family and loved ones to comfortably decide on your behalf, um, you know, especially if this has been discussed beforehand, because um, when things are happening, it's, it's stressful, it's stressful for everyone. Um, so to have that additional, you know, added thing of not knowing what you would want or not knowing what to do um, just makes it kind of worse um, altogether for people. Okay, and then and then the end, it'll ensure that you'll avoid unwanted things or care that maybe you wouldn't wouldn't have wanted if you could speak up for yourself at the time. 
Um, so that's, that's important. So I'm going to go through a couple cases um, here just to kind of give you examples of how, how this can work in, in real life practice, uh, so to speak. Okay, so here we have the case of Mr. Smith. Okay, he's a 78 year old widower. Okay, he has terminal cancer and he's on home hospice. Okay, his condition has really been deteriorating to the point where he can't really talk that much or verbalize what he what he wants. But because he knew he, he was sick before it got to that point, he did do an advanced directive and he named his son, his adult son, as his healthcare proxy. And he also expressed that he didn't wish to be kept alive by artificial means. So as his condition further worsens, his, his doctors had suggested possibly a ventilator to prolong his life, um, but his son knew that that's not what he would want, and he, he made sure that that was, that was expressed. So as a result, Mr. Smith, you know, he passed away peacefully without the ventilator and just surrounded by his son and, and family. Um, so that's that's one example here where you know he had his healthcare proxy, his son, and what sounds to be probably a living will as well, or at least he, his son was well informed um, regarding what he would have, what he, what what dad would have wanted. All right. So then here we have the case of Mrs. Jones. She's nine years old. Uh, she had a severe motor vehicle accident, unfortunately. Um, God bless her for still driving at 90. Um, and she ended up in a coma, okay? Now, her husband, who's also still living, unfortunately has very, very severe dementia, and he's, he's been deemed legally incompetent. But um, Mrs. Jones did fill out an advance directive before this terrible accident occurred at some point, saying, stating that she wanted everything done for her under any circumstances. She really wanted, you know, everybody to try their best. Um, so during this hospitalization, when she was in the coma, she went into cardiac failure. The medical staff did everything they could to resuscitate her, and they were able to, to get her back as, as she wished, but unfortunately, she continued in a comatose state. But, you know, she really, she wanted, she wanted those efforts to be made, and, and they were. Um, and that, that and in her case, she had, she had a living will. And then the last case that we're going to go through a little bit today is, is the case of Mr. White. He's a 73-year-old man with advanced diabetes, not very well controlled. He's estranged from his wife, so he did select his adult daughter as his health care proxy. Now, suddenly one night, he had a terrible seizure, um, and he never really gained consciousness uh, at the hospital. Now, in, to help care for him, the doctors had suggested a feeding tube and dialysis because his kidneys weren't great with, with, um, with his longstanding and advanced diabetes. But his daughter knows that his, his dad really was against dialysis. He really did not want to under, under any circumstances, but he was open to the feeding tube. So in the end, she agreed, okay, we can do the feeding tube, but I know dad really did not want um, did not want dialysis, so they didn't they didn't proceed with that. And so the the feeding tube did did give him a few more days of life um, before he passed. And then she can rest assured that that his wishes were carried out. So in this in this case, he had a healthcare proxy and also a living will that specifically defined that he didn't want dialysis, but he was okay with the feeding tube. Um, so that that's that's uh, how those two things worked in, in, in Mr. White's case. So, you know, I went through a lot in a very short period of time. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody has any questions um, of, about any of this or if there's anything else I can, can answer for, for you. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's something important that we all, we all need to think about um, while we're well enough to do so. Dr. Ali, you had um, touched on this a little bit, but one question we received was, uh, what would be the best way to record these wishes, if you could go back and... Yeah, sure. So, so there's a few different ways. So, so some of these, um, they're available online for a very minimal fee, like $5, that sort of thing, like the, the one I pointed out, the Aging with Dignity um, and the Five Wishes, that one's pretty... And there's a way for you to do it for, like, your whole family. Um, so that's you know, that's something, um, you know, some people prefer, depending on how complicated things it may be or how many other things you have to do, can go through, can go through your own personal lawyer as well. 
Um, I, I would imagine that would cost you more than five dollars, obviously, but uh, but but that is that that is another way to to go about it. But a lot of these documents that I'm talking about, and most of these I'm ta that I that I you know kind of um, presented to you back here are are all on these are online. They're printable, so you can have paper formats of them. They they are um, they are legal, so it's not you know these are valid documents certainly. And one more question was, where would be, where would you start to have this conversation? Would it be with your primary care physician, or um, how would you start off going about this process? Yeah, I think the first thing is to, to, to kind of think about what first for yourself. Just think about what you, what you would want if something should, should occur. And it's something that you need to talk to everybody about, family members, your, your primary care doctor, if you have a, a, you know, a life-threatening illness such as cancer or severe heart disease, you'd want to talk to your oncologist or your cardiologist in, in, in those, those senses too. Because you also want to come up with a plan that's realistic, right? So especially if you're already suffering from something, you want to make sure that, you know, what, what you're thinking about or what, what you would want is also um, uh, viable, you know, that, so that's, that's the other thing. So it's, it, you have to make sure that people around you are, are aware that, of, of what you would want done. Uh, the other question was, what's the main difference between a living will and an advanced directive? The advanced directive is kind of the, um, the umbrella name for these these things, and so a living will is just one type of advanced directive. The other one is the the healthcare proxy. So those are the two main ones. That it, yeah, so it's just a type. Uh, the living will is a type of advanced directive. Another question was: Do people typically have these conversations in the hospital? They can be certainly. Um, we would prefer if they're there. The conversations have been had. Um, sooner than that, because sometimes when somebody's already in the hospital, it's kind of a high stress situation. Um, but uh, so that's, that's why it's good to kind of do it when, when, when people are, you know, health is stable, health is well, and you have time to make decisions. Sometimes when someone's already sick or in the hospital, it, 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 you're already, everyone's kind of in panic mode, and, and maybe sometimes that's not always the best time um, to rationally think through everything. I mean, they certainly can be, you know, certain things like the DNR order, for example, is usually done at, at, a, at the hospitalization or during a hospital admission. Um, but some of these other things, um, I really would encourage you to think about ahead of time for yourself and, uh, and any other family members. Any other questions or comments? No, Dr. Riley, don't, I don't see any more questions popping up. If anybody, um, you know, if anything does come up, you know, you could uh, could always reach me uh, on my hospital email, which is my first name, Amy Ali at mpvmedicalgroup.com, and I'd be happy to to do my best to uh, uh, to answer anything that may come up at a later date or time. Thank you, everyone.
Any other questions or comments? No, Dr. Riley, don't, I don't see any more questions popping up. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> if anybody, um, you know, if anything does come up, you know, you could, uh, could always reach me uh, on my hospital email, which is my first name, amy.ali at mpvmedicalgroup.com, and I'd be happy to, to do my best to uh, uh, to answer anything that may come up at a later date or time. Thank Sounds you, Dr. Ali. All right. Thank you, everyone.